I'm Laura Baker. I'm um, part of the Center for Mindfulness Science here at USC. Um, and I just want to welcome everyone. And um, I want to remind of a couple of things before we forget. That the, a couple of other keynote talks that are coming up. Do I want to mark? Um, once on March 29th, um, it will be an online meeting with Dr. Felipe Jane talking about a new mindfulness and guided imagery approach to facilitate generalization and reduce depression in English and Spanish language family And then we have another talk, I think the last one for our mentor on April 8th. I then we'll be here again in Camilleri Hall. And that will be um, Dr. Saron and Barbara Bogarty talking about the Buddha the brain and Bach. So if you're on the mailing list, you'll get announcements for those as well. So again, welcome. I'm really excited to be able to be here and to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Dan Siegel. And um, it's exciting for a couple of reasons. Well, one is this is the first uh, keynote lecture we've had in person since before the pandemic. So I see a lot of smiling faces. Like, are we just I am just um, feeling the energy in the room, and I just want to thank everybody for being here. And I know some people are online, so I want to thank people who are there online as well. Um, so that's wonderful. Um, I also want to say that Dr. Ryan Khan could not be here today. He was supposed to be here. He really organized the whole event and. Um, Dr. Siegel's visit for the day, but unfortunately yesterday, Ryle had some kind of a medical emergency, and so he's prevented from being here. I don't have any more information than that, but perhaps we could all just try to have Ryle in our charts and our minds and just uh, send him good thoughts and wishes and prayers. Um, so, and the second reason, of course, that I'm excited is because we have Dan Siegel. <laughs> and um, lots of giggles in the room, so I presume you've heard of Dan Siegel before. Um, Dan is actually a little bit of a rock star, I want to say. A lot of people nodding and affirming that. <laughs> um, and so it's fantastic that you're able to be here with us, Dan, and to be in person. And interestingly, the talk is about connection. So it's interesting that we're all here in person and able to connect in this way. This is going to be talking about uh, connection. Um, and um, I could go on with all his accolades. He got his MD from Harvard, um, who became a clinical psychiatrist, where he's practicing his affiliation at UCLA. He helped to found the Mindfulness Awareness Research Center at UCLA. And he um, started his own Mindsight Institute here in Los Angeles. And I could go on, but I want to take time away from Dan. Um, but I do want to say a couple of other things. He's published numerous books. I'm sure um, many of you have read his books that really deal with mindfulness science, um, including several New York Times bestsellers. And The Developing Mind, which is really more of a textbook, and it's now in its third edition. And, um, Dan has this amazing way of synthesizing many different fields, disparate fields sometimes, from the arts and the sciences, um, and disparate fields in science as well, into a way that makes it understandable to most people and also makes it applicable to our, our lives. And so Dan is a gifted writer and a gifted speaker, as I'm sure if you don't already know, uh, you will know that today. He also founded uh, the Norton series on interpersonal neurobiology, a field that really he helped to establish. And they have over 80 books in that series now. But I want to tell you a small story and then I won't take any more of your time, but kind of relating back to Dan's rock star status. Um, my daughter, grown daughter, called me sometime last year and she lives in Arizona. She has two kids that are toddlers. And 
She said, Mom, have you ever heard of this guy named Dan Siegel? <laughs> and I kind of laughed. And, and I said, yeah, like, why are you we're reading this book in my mom's book club called The, the Whole Brain Child. And she said, it's amazing. And I just wondered if you've ever heard of him. So I kind of laughed and I said, well, actually, I have heard of Dan. I've known Dan. We were in kind of a study group together for the last 17, 18 years, trying to translate, uh, for want of a better word, a personality system from ancient wisdom traditions into contemporary scientific nomenclature. So I said, well, yeah, I do know Dan. I chuckled and I relayed that story to Dan a couple of days later, and he was amused. And this also just speaks to what a nice person Dan is. He immediately asked, in just a minute, he says to his assistant, hey, can you get all of my parenting books and get them up for me? And he, while we were in our meeting, signed all the copies of his parenting books, six of them, and mailed them to my daughter. And then she became kind of the rock star. <laughs> so thank you, Dan. But it just shows what a nice, generous, um, attentive uh, person Dan Siegel is. Um, so um, Dan has lectured in so many places, prestigious institutions, Google University. He's lectured to uh, uh, Pope John Paul II, right? And also to His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Um, it is such a privilege for us to be here and be able to have Dan come and share his wisdom with us. So I'm just gonna turn it over to Dan. He's gonna talk about his latest book, Interconnected. And, um, oh, I forgot to mention, he actually has some USC connections, but I think he's gonna talk about that, so I'll leave that to you. So thank you, Dan, for being here. Thank you, Laura um, and Ryle. If you're watching us, thank you, and we wish you a speedy recovery. And thank you all for being here. Um, this is a really, really special moment for me because the only reason I ever came to California was my father was offered a position in 1855 to come become a professor here at all involved in the camp engineering. So before I was born, I've been here. And then uh, my mom, when I was a little kid, went to school here to get her graduate degree in education. Uh, and then when I went to college, uh, I went here as my brother did as well. So uh, SC has a lot of meaning, and I'm gonna try to weave some of those experiences I had here uh, on this very campus um, into the story of connection. And what I'd like to do, because this is such a small, beautiful auditorium, and there's you know, relatively few of us here, make this as interactive as possible. So it is being Zoomed. I don't know if it's being recorded, but just, it, just know that if you do speak, um, you don't need to say your name, and you can keep your mask on if you want, so you'll be uh, incognito. Uh, but if you want to ask questions at any time, because it's so small and this is the first time of us being together in person here, please just raise your hand. And, and, and if I don't see your hand raised, someone shout out hand or something like that. So I'll, I'll pause. And I'm, I'm, I'm fine to do that. Um, I'm also, you know, filled with a slide deck, which I'm probably not going to show, but I'm happy to make them available to you if you want, because what I find sometimes with PowerPoint slides is they make you feel powerless as both a speaker and a recipient, and they're kind of pointless. Um, so they're both power and pointless. So um, we're going to try to avoid them, but some people say, hey, I'm a visual learner. I want to see what you're talking about. So I may zip through some of the slides and show you some, but don't worry, you will, you will have those if that's the way you like to learn. So today's talk is about connection, uh, and I'm honored to be here um, on the lands, as you probably know, of the Tongva, the original stewards of this land, and to really honor the fact that our connections are not just here in this moment, but across time. So we have people who lived on this land uh, and represented a deep connection to not only community, but to nature that unfortunately has been lost in modern culture. Uh, and whether it's the Tongva here, or if you're, more, if you're closer to the coast, the Chumash, you know, there are lessons uh, that we learn from uh, ancient traditions, the indigenous wisdom, uh, that, for example, this summer, we'll be doing a whole meeting 
of bringing science together with the indigenous teachings of the Esalen tribe in the, in the Monterey County area. If you're interested, uh, just you can check that out. So we want to be open to that. And what's fascinating in, in um, the journey that this body has been through is what happens when you realize there are so many independent ways of finding truth. So here in USC, um, I was a biology major, and I sub-majored in biochemistry. Uh, and I learned a lot about catalysis and you know how the enzymatic reactions that we were studying in living creatures allowed them to be alive. And it was really cool. And I love, love, love biology. And I'm very proud of my biology degree here. Um, but those connections that we have uh, need to be put in a larger context. So my research area when I was here was to try to figure out how salmon could be hatched in fresh water, so connected to that environment, but somehow be adaptable enough to live in a saltwater environment. Like what was going on? So that's what I was studying. We tried to find the enzyme, and we ultimately did, that allowed the density of stuff in the, in the plasma to change when they moved into salt water. And that was a very exciting journey. But at night, just a few feet from here, in the old uh, student union, up on the top floor, you may not know this, but we had a suicide prevention service. And I volunteered to be one of those suicide prevention folks. So during the day, I'd be over in the lab studying these you know, biochemical reactions. And then in the evening, I'd work over in the suicide prevention center. And so when someone called in the community, not just the students, who was having the internal subjective experience that they didn't want to be alive anymore, and they got on the phone, and sometimes for one last time, we're going to try to find a connection that would give them hope. We were taught that the way you communicate on that phone line made all the difference. So in those days, this was the mid-70s, you know, we were learning a little bit about the brain, not as much as we'd learn later on, but you know, we were taking guesses about things. Pharmaceuticals were coming into play. So if you said someone's depressed, you know, give them some kind of medication. Um, but if you had said on a person on a phone line, wow, you know, I'll bet your serotonin levels and your prefrontal cortex are really low right now. What do you think that person who was suicidal in a crisis of despair might do? Hang up on you and do what? and their lives, and their lives, right? And I recently had a deep, close friend of mine end his life because no form of intervention that anyone could come up with uh, helped. And after trying for four years, he, he made a decision to end his life, didn't call any suicide prevention service. But my mentor was a guy named Ed Schneidman, and Ed was the founder of the American Suicidology uh, Organization, and the LA County Suicide Prevention Service. And what Ed coined was an incredibly powerful term, psych ache. The achy, the achy, the ache in your psyche. Now, psych ache isn't brain ache. Now, of course, it's related to the brain. So we have an interesting thing. We're just a few feet from here, too. We have a, a brain imaging center. So we can ask the question, like, well, why wouldn't it help to say to someone, I think your serotonin levels are low. Let's assume that's true, or even if it's not true. You know, why wouldn't that help? What do you think? Why is making those words come out of my mouth as a speaker not the same as saying, Jonas, thank you for calling. I really can sense the despair you feel and how hopeless it is that you've lost your you know, mother and father in the car accident and you don't see any future. And I can feel that pain. And I know sometimes when our, our, we get in such a state, you don't see any options for anything better. But I can tell you there are options that you're not even aware of now. So please tell me more about what's going on, something like that. Um, and how would that feel for you? That might help. That might help. And then we would then have a, a dialogue. We'd start talking. And, really talk about the, the experience of psych ache. The ache in the psyche is obviously related to something going on in your body, including your brain, but it's not the same as the brain, right? So 
This psyche that Ed Schneidman named is an ache in, if you look up psyche in the Webster's Dictionary, it's the spirit, the soul, the intellect, and the mind. So part of what we're going to talk about today is, you know, is connection a mental experience? And how does that relate to a correlate of it, which is both the relational experience that just happened between the two of us in a communication and what happens in the brain. So we're not saying the brain is not a part of connection, but we're saying there's something larger than what goes on in your skull. Maybe even something larger that goes on inside your skin and case body. Right? So another thing I was doing when I was doing the you know, suicide prevention service and doing the, the biochemistry research on salmon was I was, a, this is going to sound strange, but I was on the ballroom dance team for USC. <laughs> and we used to learn, you know, to dance, and we would dance at halftime at football games, which was kind of a very strange contrast, <laughs> you know, beating themselves up, and now here are these dancers walking. But <laughs> well, that's what we did. Um, uh, and our, one of our main things was that we would dance to In the Mood. You know that song? Maybe, maybe we can play it if someone has it on their, their Spotify. In the Mood. But anyway, you, we would dance to this thing, and you were both, you know, in your body figuring out how the music would connect with you. So we're going to get into connection very, very soon. Like, what is connection? What are they made of? So you'd feel it in your body. But then in ballroom dancing, you would have a partner. And you would dance with your partner. But then on a team, you have like 10 pairs that are doing all sorts of weird, wild moves. Um, and if your mind is intact, you, you don't miss the turns that you're supposed to miss. Um, but some people were on substances, so they, they would miss the turn. That was very funny. For some of us, it was funny. Others, it was a disaster. But um, so what does it mean to be a team that's connected to each other? Obviously, their brain is involved in that and their whole body. But now what is going on on that dance team that we would say, whoa, that dance team is really connected to each other and the music. What, what would you be actually sensing? Well, this is a question I would like you to really let sink into you. Because um, for me, as we go forward, it just when I was done with college and I w went on to medical school, um, I thought, you know, my love of all this stuff I'm talking about, dancing and you know, working in the suicide prevention service, studying chemistry, you know, in terms of the salmon would be perfect, like for medicine, you know, so I was there. But in the first two years of medical school, what was absolutely um, terrifying, really, um, was that my professors, who were super accomplished, it was a research institution, and super accomplished, super smart, in certain ways smart um, people, could have a patient that they would do the labs on, do all the diagnostic tests, who they came up with a terminal illness. And I would be there by their side, you know, in my little white coat, and they had their big white coat or whatever. And, you know, and I'm watching them, and they would say, well, uh, I'm sorry to report this, but, you know, it looks like all the tests show, you know, you have this terrible illness, you'll probably be dead in about six months. And they'd get up and walk away. And I would go, and I'd pull on their big white coat, and I'd say, um, excuse me. And they'd go, what? I said, you just told that person they're going to die in six months. Wouldn't you like to spend some time with them? They go, why? Now, if you were a physician or training to be a physician, what would you think would be the reason you would spend a little more time than, I'm sorry this is happening, here's the story, and leave? Why would you do that? First, do no harm. So why would it be harmful? You, the person's a scientifically trained physician, you know, fancy professor at this fancy school, who's now telling a person who came in for the answer, the answer, you're dying, goodbye. Why is that doing harm? Yeah, exactly. Delivering such devastating news, and let's really look at your beautiful words, and not taking time to process it. So what is the processing that would happen between that physician and that patient? What does that mean to process things? So ultimately, and we'll come to try to answer that in a moment, but ultimately what happened to me in those first two years in Boston was I said, I don't want to become like those people. They're robotic monsters. 
And I am not going to be socialized to become like them. And you probably know from research on medical students, we start out as pre-meds with average levels of empathy, which is fine. And then every year of medical training, it gets less and less and less and less. And then the correlate with losing empathy is burnout becomes more and more and more. And even recently, I was asked to give you know, a training for all the Stanford professors of medicine and nursing. And um, I show up there. This is now going a little fast forward. I show up there, and um, you know, uh, the person introducing me um, is the dean of the medical school. And he's an internist. And you know, there's always this discussion about internist versus psychiatrist versus surgeons or whatever. So the internist gets up there, and he goes, you know something? We put the education for all of us in the hands of a surgeon the person who invited me to come. And he goes, and he invites a psychiatrist. How stupid is that? And I go, oh my god, this is going to be a hard day. Start out that way. And then he leans over to the table near him. And he picks up a piece of paper. He goes, let me show you how wrong I am. This morning, I'm getting ready to come to this ridiculous day here with the psychiatrist, he says. And there's a report of all the medical training programs in the country that Five years earlier, they detected that about 45% of postgraduate, after you get your MD trainees, are burning out. They have depression, despair, anxiety, and many are suicidal. It's 45%. And they found out about it. And he goes, now we just got the report that five years later, it's now 56%. This is before the viral pandemic. Now these numbers are even higher. So. He says, so I was totally wrong. We, we are not taking care of our own. Another study, just to show you what it means when you don't train someone about what we're talking about, about connection, showed um, an amazing find. This was 2011. Uh, and I'll try to remember the first name of the person who did the study. But it was in 2011. Basically, what they did was they had one set of primary care physicians see someone coming in for a common cold. And the other set were seeing people also for a common cold. Set A made about a 30-second empathic comment. It would be something like, wow, you have a cold. That's what it looks like what you have. Um, you know, you're a graduate student. You're taking exams. It must be so frustrating to have a, a cold right now. You know, do X, Y, and Z, and it'll take care of your cold. The other group said the same thing minus the empathic 30-second comment, just you have a cold, do X, Y, and Z. One group got over their cold a day sooner, and when they tested their blood, their immune system was much more robust to fight the virus. Which group do you think was which? Why would a 30-second empathic comment allow you to get over your cold a day sooner? Someone cares about you. And what is caring made of? Right? What is caring made of? Because that's exactly why I dropped out of medical school. So I dropped out of medical school, and I thought I'd either become a dancer, and I was going to join the Boston Ballet. They said, you are too old. So I joined a jazz group, and they said, straighten your knees. I said, they are straight. They said, you're not going on a stage. And I was going to be a choreographer, and I was actually in charge of um, uh, my girlfriend at the time. She was a dancer, and so we were, we were, they were, she got in this film thing. We were, we were filming all the dance performances at UCLA at Royce Hall. And then I realized I didn't care at all how dance looked. I cared how it felt. And then I thought I would starve to death. And before that, I had thought about going to become a salmon fisherman up in Vancouver Island. It's a long story. But the bottom line, and I actually, so people were asking about this. So I wrote a book called Mind, which tells these funny stories. Um, but the issue I learned was that you could really focus on, let's just name it. We haven't said it yet subjective experience. And you could say that what a dance feels like is a subjective experience. It's a, it, and subjective doesn't mean it's less than objective. It means it's an internally experienced felt sense of something. So when someone has a cold and the doctor says, oh, you know, this must be so hard for you. It must be so frustrating. They're identifying your subjective sensation. Um, when those physicians that, I, that were my teachers called the attendings, I'm not sure what they were attending to, but, um, but when those attendings would say, you know, you're dying, goodbye, they weren't attending to subjective experience. When the suicide prevention person calls and says, you know, I'm feeling this X, Y, and Z, and you say, I can sense your despair, 
you are tuning in, you're focusing your attention on the internal subjective experience of another person. So on a relational sense, what we want to say is there's something about subjective experience. Well, it has that unfortunate word subjective, or some people use the word first person, meaning only you really know you're having it. Connection, interpersonal connection, is based on sharing subjective experience. So I'm a therapist now. When I do couples therapy, it's all about that. How are you sharing subjective experience? And to put it really simply, if you're alone with your own subjective experience, like right now in this auditorium, if you're alone with it, or people out in Zoom land are, uh, wow, well, that's either a, a great phone beeper, or what's that? Or it's Santa, Santa Claus is coming. So when you join your inner experience, let's call that a me, with another person's me, you create a we. And that's what connection is made of, where instead of being constrained by your skull or your skin and say, for example, yourself is only you as an individual, and we'll come to this word self in a moment, your experience, even of subjective sense, like the person on the suicide prevention line or the person with the common cold study, or you know, when I decided to go back to medical school because I thought, you know something? The mind is real, and not only is it real, it's really important. So I made up this word, mind sight. That's the name of our institute, you know, because I needed something to protect me. So when these fancy professors who were evaluating me, you know, lacked this mind sight ability, I would be like an anthropologist, like studying them. Like, what is this bizarre culture that's this mind sightless world? And the fact is, we know later on that even in the brain itself, the way you represent mental states in yourself or in other human beings is very different from how you perceive the physical world. So we have physical sight and we have mind sight. Mind sight allows you to have insight for what's going on inside your subjective world. It allows you to have empathy for the inner world of someone else. And it allows you to actually have something called integration, which is where you don't lose the me to become a part of a we. Right. So it's a long story, which I'll get to a short version of in a moment. But integration can be defined as the linkage of differentiated parts of a system in which you're not losing the differentiation when you create the connection of linkage. So in neuroscience, I know this is used a little differently in mathematics also, but in neuroscience, the words that are used are segregation is often used for what we say as differentiation. Um, and then integration is used as just the linkage part. So we're using it differently in that. So if any of you are neuroscience people, you're probably using these terms a little differently, but whatever, we want to be just clear whatever terms we use, that the balance of linkage and differentiation, we're going to name as integration. Other fields don't use that same term that way. But there, in mathematics, for example, there is no term for the balance of the two. And I was working with mathematicians, and I said, well, I need a term because I'm an educator, so I'm going to use the term integration. And for them, it's not exactly the same either. You know, Integration just means addition. But the way we're using integration here is it's the balance of linkage and differentiation. So when I walk across the stage like this, I've got to literally integrate my left and right legs, right? Right? They're differentiated and they're linked. And if they weren't, it would be like some, like this, right? If they weren't walking together, right? Or I have a patient who just had a surgery, and in, in the surgery, there was a complicated, unfortunate um, side effect that couldn't have been avoided, but it led to, um, it led to a lesion. Uh, that gave him something called hemineglect, which means that his subjective experience of half of his body is that that half of his body is not his body, right? So they had interpreted it as he now was paralyzed. And so they were working with him like someone who's just paralyzed. So I went very closely and carefully through his subjective experience. And he could move both those limbs just fine, but when he touched them, not on the skin, but deeply, his interoceptor, the perception of the interior, was that that's not my leg. 
but his skin, it felt like his leg. So we knew where the lesion was, so now what we could do is give him these exercises so he could say, it's my leg, it's my leg. And what we're trying to do is integrate, literally, in other parts of his brain, hopefully, a way where he can now feel like, that's my leg, because otherwise this is how he walks. He has to look at his leg and go, I'm moving that thing. And he doesn't, the other one works fine. It's like, like that. So even with neurological consequences of surgery, you can use subjective experience in a very, very powerful way. Okay, so what I want to talk to you about is this word connection. Let me just see, are there any questions so far? Does it make sense? Okay, so when I got back to school, um, you know, I was uh, really saddened to find that not only were the professors the same, I don't know why they would have changed, but um, as I went through my different clerkships, um, I'll just give you one story of the many, many stories that happened. But this one story is my first patient that was taking care of for a two-month rotation uh, was very sick, and he died. And um, I was in rounds uh, when, uh, when he died, and the, um, my resident, I was a medical student, the resident came in, and she said, you know, Mr. Jones died. Um, do you want to come by his body before they remove it? I said, yeah. So I got up. I went with her. We stood by his body. We tried everything we had, could have done to try to save him. It was just the end of his life. That happens. And she and I are crying. And the nurses come in. They're crying. And we just take some silence. They take his body away. And, you know, and that was that. And that afternoon, you know, I had a pre-planned meeting with my attending. And um, so I go in the room. And he says, um, Daniel? Uh, I said, yeah. He goes, um, why did you leave rounds this morning? So I said, oh, yeah, you know, I'm so sorry, because, but, you know, my resident came in, Mr. Jones, we were taking care of him two months, and he died, and, you know, and now I'm starting to cry again. And he goes, there's no time for tears if you're going to be a doctor. Kind of, I'm actually toning it down, um, like that. And I will never forget the feeling of chills in me. And this was, in, in medical school, the most important rotation you have is internal medicine, which is what this was. And I knew if I were going to progress forward in what you're supposed to progress at, whatever progression is, you know, I had to actually do well. And he goes, so you better get your stuff together if you're going to do well in this course. So I left there. And the next patient I interacted with was my favorite teacher in medical school who had developed leukemia. And I was supposed to start preparation for his bone marrow transplant. And I'll never forget, he sits there and he goes, disease happens to us all. And I go, oh my God, how am I going to do this? And I remember the subjective feeling inside of me was, I can't feel anything. I've got to shut off my subjective experience. I've got to shut off my feelings. And I kind of remember the feeling in my body was like, I took a deep breath and I go, OK. And then I was like, going to do all his labs. I was going to get them all ready. I was going to make sure he was going to be fine. I was going to study all the research. I was going to present it on rounds, which I did. And the end of the course came. He did fine in his bone marrow transplant. The end of the course came, and that attending who told me no tear, time for tears comes and says, Daniel, you did an excellent job with that patient, and you're getting an excellent in this course, which was really hard to get. And he goes, you succeeded. And in my mind, I said, and you failed. And I could feel why the research was showing that the connection between a physician or any healthcare provider, really, but especially medical medical system, you know, could shut off the connection that physicians feel toward their patients. And here's what happens when you shut off your subjective experience about your patients. You shut off your subjective experience about your loved ones. You shut it off about your own bodily experience. So years and years later, after I became, I was in pediatrics, and then went into psychiatry, and then child and adolescent psychiatry, and then I decided to become a researcher studying connection. So I got a grant from the National Institute of Mental Health to study parent-child relationships and its relationships to narrative and memory and stuff like that. That's another story. But, but during all that uh, experience, I became uh, someone who was uh, known in, in the University. I was at UCLA, if I can say that here. Um, you know, uh, uh, I was someone known, you know, to work with trauma, 
you know, I, I was a trauma expert or whatever. And, and trauma in, for a child is just a good example of this talk of connection. It's the opposite of connection, whether it's neglect or abuse. There is a violation in the healthy integrative connection that is what we call secure attachment. So even though my colleagues in the field I'm trained in to do research is attachment research, you know, they don't use the word integration or the concept of any of this stuff. But to me, a, a parent-child relationship that promotes well-being in a child, uh, kind of what Laura was talking about about that book, that whole book, Whole Brain Child, which I wrote Tina Payne Bryson, a USC doctoral student in social work, go Trojans. Um, uh, what Tina and I wrote was she, she came to me. I was teaching over at whatever that place is across the street. Um, for something on like, uh, I forgot what it was, some conference on something 20 years ago. And she came and said, oh, I want to study with you, you know. And I was a UCLA uh, person at those times. And I said, well, that's great, but you have, to, you have to come to the enemy campus. She said, I'll do it, I'll do it. And she had a six month old at the time. And then she had another child, and then she had another child. And so she started raising her children based on this integration principle, which has these different domains. Anyway, and their kids were coming out really well, and my kids, who are getting old enough now. So a prior parenting book I wrote, you know, and I wrote other books about them, they were now old enough to ban me from writing about them. <laughs> but hers were not. So, so we got together, because now she could write about her kids. And I could make my kids sound like people I knew. Um, and so that book is all about how to create integration in a relationship in various ways that we can talk about. And the integration is basically the ultimate in connection. So one of the jobs of the strange jobs I, and unusual jobs I had was to be the psychiatrist for something called the Survivors of the Shoah Foundation. And the Survivors of the Shoah Foundation was um, an organization that was, uh, uh, had the goal of collecting as many um, narrative uh, accounts of people who had survived the Holocaust. So the Shoah is the, the Holocaust, the, the destruction of the Jewish people um, in the hands of the, of the Nazi regime. Um, anyway, so we were collecting them. And my job was to keep the, uh, the, the people who were doing the interviews and the coders from getting massively depressed and getting what's called secondary post-traumatic stress. So that's what we were working on. But part of my job was to go to Europe. And I went to uh, Poland. And I was living in a, a town called Kazimierz Dolny. And there, we went to a concentration camp called Madonic. And in Madonic, it was an unusual camp because it was right in the middle of a regular town. It wasn't like on the outskirts like Auschwitz or uh, other um, camps. And uh, the person giving me a tour, uh, it turns out, was a child during the Holocaust. And we were up, uh, we, we went through the gas chambers where they had had gassed 500,000 Jews. Um, and then they would take the dead bodies and bring them to the crematorium, the ovens. And the ovens still had the bone chips from the people who were slaughtered uh, with this madness. Um, so we were up there, standing there. And, and where these ovens were, you could look out over to the town, which was just right nearby, a stone's throw away. And you could see where the apartments were. And he goes, that was my apartment right there on that street. And I said, well, did you know any guards? He goes, oh, yeah. The guards lived there. I said, well, what were they like? And he said, they were nice people. I said, well, say more about that. He goes, well, they were nice to their children. They were nice to their spouses. They were nice to their dogs. So I want to ask you, how can that be? How can a nice person participate in slaughtering other people, gassing them, burning them? Millions, millions and millions of people. What do you think? They don't see them as humans. They don't see a connection to them. Exactly. They don't see them as humans. They don't see a connection to them. Now, right around that time, we were just, it was the decade of the brain. We were just beginning to learn, this is like 1996, 97, about you know, which different circuits, because we could look peer under the, the skull. And we're just beginning to learn about what the circuits of empathy were that allowed you to feel another person's feelings. That's part of empathy. 
you know, empathy has at least five components. You feel another person's feelings. You can understand another person's mental state, so cognitive empathy. You can have their, take on their perspective, like look through their glasses, so perspective taking, right? You can also have what's called empathic joy, where you actually take pleasure in another person's success. Imagine that, <laughs> right? And there's empathic concern, which is a gateway to com compassion, which is different. Compassion is a set of different circuits, but what it allows you to do is feel the suffering that's going on. Internal compassion will be one thing, and uh, relational compassion will be another, but you can feel the suffering, number one, try to imagine what you could do to reduce the suffering, number two, and number three, do that thing. So you could say, those physicians that were my teachers were not compassionate. When someone yells at a student and says, there's no time for tears, that's not a compassionate thing to say. And when someone sees someone on the ground and kicks them over and over and over again and kills them, that has happened just last week, or remember back in the pandemic when George Floyd was murdered. So what's the story with this? How can you have no connection with a fellow human being, let alone a fellow living being? Well, the story probably began about 50 million years ago. So Steve Swomey is one of our world's experts uh, on primates. And he and I were teaching at a conference once, and I was bemoaning these things that keep on happening over and over and over of human beings participating in racism, in genocide. And we were going for a walk. And he said, Dan, this isn't good news. Because I said, how long has this been going on, Steve? He said, it's not good news. I said, what's the story? He goes, it's probably 50 million years. I said, humans have only been around two, three 300,000 years. How can you say 50 million? He goes, we're primates. So I said, what's the story? He goes, I take care of this monkey colony, and there's the alpha family and the beta family. And if there is a vulnerability in the alpha family, like the leader dies, or one time he said the leader died, and the second in command, who is still a strong monkey, you know, we had to take her out to the veterinarian, something was wrong with her. The minute we took her out and the two leaders were gone, the beta family had been waiting for years, came and literally, I won't give you the graphic details, but killed the other family. They're all monkeys, same species. So let's just name this in terms of connection in group versus out group processes that the primate nervous system probably survived based on that. You figured out as social creatures, you know, mammals are very social. So for 220 million years, we've been mammals. For 50 million years of that 220 million years, we've been primates. And then in our primate history, we have this big in-group, out-group distinction. So fast forward to a few hundred thousand years ago, we become incredibly complex social creatures, way more hierarchical and complex than other primates. And we develop something that you may not have heard of, but let me see how many of you know about it. How many of you know about alloparenting? Maybe you know alloparenting. So alloparenting, Sarah Hurdy, H-R-D-Y, uh, is a primatologist and anthropologist who studies this very important finding. Not that many mammals do this, but allo means other, and parenting is you know, the person who takes care of you and your baby. So alloparenting means, in her book Mothers and Others, she talks about this in great detail, that human beings have a unique, uh, very rare among mammals, way that we distribute the care of an infant to non-mothers. Could be a father, could be another relative, it could be a member of the community that's carefully selected. So not just anybody, but it's a select group of, we call them, my field, we call them attachment figures with an S. So you don't have just one attachment figure in 
your human lineage, you can have one, two, three, four. You can have a selective few. Now, what does alloparenting do? Well, one of the theories, which I find really incredibly compelling, is that alloparenting required that if you were the mother giving birth to this baby, and you're the father, and you are genetically invested in this little baby, but now you live in a community, and you're in a species where you can now hand your baby to someone else. I'm going to take my baby, and what am I going to do if I'm going to pick here among these three wonderful people, and I'm leaning on Laura, and I'm going to pick Laura and give her the baby. Here, Laura. What do I need to do before I hand this baby to her? I need to trust her. And how am I going to have that connection of trust? Not yet. What am I going to do? Well, I could sacrifice. I don't want to sacrifice my baby. Right? But it would be a sacrifice if I didn't do what I'm asking you. What, what do I need to do so it's not a sacrifice? I got to establish trust. How do I establish trust? How do I really establish that connection? Yeah, please. You got it. What do you what did you say? Eye contact. I'm going to have eye contact exactly. And what is my eye contact good like we're going to have right now? What does my eye contact allow me to do? It's a window to the soul exactly. Remember soul, spirit, intellect and mind. You develop mind sight because we had allo parenting. I've got to know at least three things. I've got to know what is Laura's intention. I got to know where's her attention and what is in your awareness. So I got to try to figure all that out. And those are all a part of her subjective experience, intention, attention, and awareness. So now whatever I'm doing to try to figure that out, let's just call it mind sight. I'm going to see Laura's mind as best I can. It's an approximation. It can never be really accurate, but I can approximate it so I can try to be trusting. So I go, where's your intention, Laura? <laughs> oh, OK, good. And where's your attention going to be on this baby I'm about to hand, hand you? You're going to pay attention to her? And is she going to be in your awareness? Yes. OK. There. So now I give the baby, and I'll, I go to the, do stuff that the community needs me to do, and we differentiate our roles. Right? We have an incredibly huge capacity for integration. But to do that, I needed Mindsight to have that connection. Right? So that history of having alloparenting, which freed us up to make an incredibly collaborative species, our parenting was the basis for us differentiating our roles and, and creating an unbelievable capacity for creativity, for collaboration, for deep connection that we all know is possible. OK, so now we've got all of us, maybe all of us in the room, are in our community. But now there's a knock at the door. We don't know if we can trust them, because they're not in the in-group. We're all the in-group. Right? We don't know if we can trust them. So we push them away and all sorts of other things we might do. So in-group, out-group distinction came from our primate history. It now gets elaborated with the mindset issue. And so to say it kind of simply, if you look at a human being in front of you, and this, these are studies done at Dartmouth, and I can't remember the name of the researcher, but um, I hope it comes to my memory bank. But anyway, so a set of studies were done, basically, where you took Dartmouth students, and you took photographs of Dartmouth students, and you had different paragraphs underneath them. And you had the Dartmouth students in a brain scanner. And what you said was, just to give you an example, let's say there was a Korean uh, gentleman's face. So there was this Korean gentleman. And one of the paragraphs says, you know, this is Jim Soul, and he was, you know, born in Seattle. He went to Dartmouth for college, and now he works down in Cambridge as a startup, you know, and he likes to listen to whatever the current music was. And no matter what the racial background of the Dartmouth student is, those mind sight circuits of empathy and compassion, they are fully activated. But then as you know, all these photographs are going by, you come up with basically a similar photograph, Korean gentleman's picture. Only this time, it says, he was born in Seoul, Korea, uh, Korea. He really enjoys wiping the grease off of car repair shops. 
And in his spare time, he plays with Barbie dolls. Something like that. The mind side circuits shut off. So think about why that would be. The only difference was the paragraph. Why would the mind side circuits be turned on with one paragraph and turned off with the other? Something in cognition, yeah. So cognition can be used as a term meaning information processing. And information can be thought of as energy patterns with symbolic value, absolutely. So the paragraph of symbolic value of the Barbie doll paragraph, I can't relate to that, exactly. So it's a cognitive process. And the paragraph that says I can relate to it, where I can say, oh, that person's like me, or that person's not like me, right? Now I want you to think about those words and hold them in the front of your mind. Mm -hmm. The person who you know, is in the startup is like me. The person who plays the Barbie doll is not like me. And just think about that phrase, like me or not like me. And I'm going to tell you another study that was done at Yale University. Um, and when I saw this, I said, oh my god, we have so much work to do. Here's the study. You take 14-month-old children, so they're, they're just beginning to walk, and you know, they got you know, all this excitement about being alive, and you figure out which kind of cereal they like. And I'll just give you an example. Let's say, let's say they really like granola, and they really hate cornflakes. Okay? And you just find out, because every kid has their preference. Fine. Then you have a puppet come in, and let's make this a green puppet. The green puppet likes the granola, too. You do a little play game. And then a red puppet later comes in, and the red puppet likes the cornflakes. Then the puppets go away. Now, you set it up where the puppets come back. There's no more cereal involved. And now you watch the children, one by one, you know, alone, interact with the puppets. One puppet, they treat really nicely with a lot of affection and kind of playing with it. The other, they treat harshly and discard it. Which is which? The one that shares the like of the cereal they treat kindly. Exactly. Now, if you were like a resource competition person, you would have said the opposite, right? You'd say, well, I'm going to be mad at the one who might take the cereal I like because there's only a limited amount of cereal, and so I'm going to beat them up. No, it's exactly like you're saying. Now, think about the English language and the word like. I like who is like me. Isn't that interesting? I like who is like me. So we have criteria of like that infers both a, a preference for someone, like I like them, or, or similarity to someone like. And it's the same word in English. Isn't that amazing? Anyway, so this study of 14 months old, why did it make me feel really like there's a lot of work to do? It shows that it, it's very likely we have built-in in-group, out-group distinctions based on the criteria we are using for our identity. I'm a kid who likes granola. That puppet likes granola. Therefore, that criteria of identity means they are like me, and I will like them. Does that make sense? So we come back to the Dartmouth study then, and it's just like a cognitive thing like you're saying. If you do a cognitive assessment that says, I don't relate to Barbie doll and cleaning up you know, grease on you know, car mechanic shops. That's not like me. You literally shut off your circuits of empathy. So if that Nazi guard had a cognitive process and a social process and an emotional process, the whole thing is together, that basically said, this group of people is like me. And this group of people is not like me. When it comes to, and these are studies called mortality salience studies, um, also called terror management studies, what they show is that when we're under a state of um, scarcity, when the human being is under a state of threat, because there's not enough resources, that's what scarcity is. When they're under a state of threat, and you can do this in subliminal studies that are quite 
uh, ingenious the way the scientists have studied these. Your in-group, out-group distinction process is intensified. And you treat people who are in your in-group, the ones who are like you, with more kindness and care and collaboration and connection. And you're going to join with them. But if they're in the out-group, watch out. You'll treat them with more hostility and, as we can see from our propensity for genocide, you will stop seeing them as human. You know. So I had the great privilege of working with Elijah Cummings, who was a congressman in Baltimore. And through a various set of routes, uh, people had me meet with Elijah. And he said, Dan, you know, there's a huge amount of racism and murder going on in my town, Baltimore. So um, can you come help me with that? I said, I don't know what I can do, but I'll, I'll do anything with you, whatever you want to do. So I went to Baltimore, and we had a meeting. And he brought together people who were identified as black and people who were identified as white for the first time ever. And we were meeting in this room, and the tension was so thick you could cut it with a knife. You could feel just this hostility in the room. So what I did was I did a practice, which I invite you all to do on your own time. We don't have time to do it today, called the Wheel of Awareness. And I know I'm here as the inaugural lecturer for the Mindfulness Science Center, which I feel very honored to have. Um, for me, mindfulness is basically an integration of consciousness practice, which we can talk about what that means in a moment. But I had the people in Baltimore do the Wheel of Awareness practice. And what it is basically is, is if you could picture a wheel where you have an outer rim and an inner hub, um, we can integrate consciousness by identifying consciousness as having at least two things that are differentiable. So think for a moment about what is consciousness. What, what does it mean to have mindful awareness? Or what does it mean to be conscious? What, what does that involve? To be present. To be present, great. And, and in what way are you being present? What, what, what is the internal experience of being present? Focusing. So you can focus your attention, great. And awareness, and you can have awareness and awareness of something we'll get to in, in very shortly called self. So you have attention, exactly. You have awareness, and you have this thing called self. Um, OK, great. And nothing in that seems particularly differentiable. Um, but one way to take those three things is to put them under the umbrella of, watch this experience. If I say, good afternoon, how many of you heard that I said good afternoon? Raise your hand. OK. So take a look, everyone heard. Now, in that simple experience, you had two things happen. You had the awareness that I said good afternoon, that's the knowing, and you had the known, which was good afternoon. I could have said hello, I could have said goodbye, whatever I could have said. So at least you can differentiate the knowing from the known, at a minimum, for consciousness. So let's put the knowns on a rim of this wheel, just visual metaphor. It's actually a table in our office. But I brought, I brought these patients that I, I'm a therapist, so I would bring my patients up from the couch or the chair. I would take them around this table, which has a center that's glass and a wooden rim. And I would say, let's integrate consciousness. And they knew I do weird things in therapy. Um, so they go, what are you talking about? I said, well, you know, consciousness is knowing and the known. And let's put the known on the rim, and let's put the knowing in the hub, and let's take attention and make it this singular kind of spoke uh, that's holding up the table. No one wanted to call it the table of awareness, so we call it the wheel of awareness. And, and so I started doing that with patients, and they started getting a reduction in anxiety, a reduction in mild to moderate depression. They started getting an improvement in trauma symptoms. And for some of my patients, unfortunately, who had terminal illnesses, they had a reduction, if not an elimination, of panic in the face of death. It was mind boggling. So then, you know, I'm also an educator, so then I started teaching it to my, um, my students who are therapists, and they started finding personally it helpful, and they started doing it with their clients, and they found that helpful. So then I started doing workshops, and I'm a scientist, so I did it with the first 10,000 people in rooms like this, and I recorded all the results, and I did it exactly the same way, so it would be a controlled thing. And then once I had the first 10,000 results, then I did it for another, and my assistant counted this, so this is not an exaggeration, before the pandemic, 50,000 people in person before the pandemic hit. And the results have been just quite amazing. Anyway, I've written a couple of books about that, um, the mindful brain, or aware, or becoming aware. Um, but for here, what I want to say is, 
I knew before I did this with Elijah that pretty powerful things can happen. So there we are in Baltimore. That was the background on the wheel. So we do the wheel of awareness, and people are taking basically on the rim, you've got four segments, which are basically, and we haven't used this term yet, so I'll bring it up with a lot of caution that you can get people chasing you down hallways saying, don't use this term, uh, which I've found fascinating just as a person on the planet to see people so angry about this. But the term is a term that I learned here at USC when I took my physics course. In physics, anyway, people don't chase you down a hallway when you use this term. Um, and I used what I, this term, which I'm going to say in a moment, that I learned in physics. I used it in my biochemistry research. Because when you study enzymatic reactions, without this term, you could not do your studies. So I don't know why people chase me down hallways, but many people do. Um, so I'm going to say this term. I'm a little nervous, because this is kind of where I grew up here at USC. Um, but the term is energy. <laughs> now, why do you say yay? Yeah, it's some kind of energy in the system. And when you said yay, you could feel the energy in that, right? Now, some energy is pure energy. Now, what kind of energy is that? That's air molecules moving, called sound, right? Um, but I can wave my hands around, and that's, you're seeing that because of photons. Photons are energy. Anyway, other energy has symbolic value. So energy in a formation that symbolizes something, that formation that symbolizes something, we use the term information. So I know there are physicists who say the universe is made of energy, and that's consistent with this, that information arises from energy, which changes, so we call it flow. Other physicists say, no, 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 no. The universe is made of information, and energy flows from that. So if we come up with what's called consilience, a common ground, you can have the phrase energy and information. And because it changes over what we'll call time for now, it's called energy and information flow. All right, so in this rim of the wheel are basically different sources of energy. So if I go like this, where was that energy coming from that you experienced it? Think about that. Well, this is probably the simplest question I'm going to ask you. You've gotten all the other questions. <laughs> OK, great. All right, let's go for that, Jonas. Yeah, so it depends on how far back in time. So let's just go like two seconds. Two seconds is because you Exactly. So the mood of these hands of this body called Dan made some air molecules move. It went through this air. And it went, if you're in this room, it went to your eardrums, right? And if you're in the Zoom land, uh, I don't know if it's Zoom, but whatever it's on, um, I should keep on emphasizing Zoom. But if you're in the online land, you know, it went through a whole series of electrical transformations. And if it was in a fiber optics, it would be photons, whatever. OK, but let's just stay with this room for now. So it was air molecules moving. So it came from outside the body. Let's use the body as a spatial reference. So the first segment of four segments on the rim is things that come from outside your body. So what is it? It's hearing, it's seeing, it's smelling, it's tasting, it's touching. The five senses. Energy flow from outside the body. We're going to use the body as a, just a spatial reference point. The second segment in science we call the sixth sense, interestingly. And we also have the name intero for interiorception, for perception. It's the sensation of the interior signals of the body inside the skin and case body, muscles, bones, genitals, intestines, lungs, heart. Right? So Jonas and I met each other first, if I can say it, 
at UCLA. And uh, one of our colleagues, uh, you know, Marco, you know, was big in studying these different things about interoception. Here at USC, Antonio Damasio, and I'm sure Hannah was involved as Antonio here. I don't know if he's here right now, but you know, Antonio did some beautiful, beautiful work about um, somatic markers and the importance of interoception. So this is not just some kind of, you know, oh, it's not so important. In the interior of the body, it turns out to be super, super important for all sorts of things. But that's the second segment of the rim. Now, besides the knowns of stuff coming from outside the body and then the interior signals of the body proper, the torso, what else can you become aware of? This will be the third segment. What, what else is a known that you might become aware of? <laughs> Hello. Hello. Good to see you. <laughs> Mental activity, thank you. So mental activity. So what's a mental activity? This is a great theater. Look at this. <laughs> like, what would be an example of a mental activity? It's probably coming from your head brain. And I say this because Antonio has beautifully instructed us that we have three brains, right? A brain in the intestine, a brain in around your heart, and the head brain, which he says is in service of the whole body. Um, and his book, uh, The Strange Order of Things, is a beautiful uh, book, I highly recommend it, which talks about that. Anyway, so w these are probably things going on in the head. They're really important. Give me an example of what a mental activity might be. Thoughts, exactly. And some people call that cognition. Energy flow patterns that are in symbolic. Often we have them in terms of ling linguistic, but you can have thoughts that are not linguistic. What else? Feelings. Right, so Antonio might put feelings is a word uh, related to the body's sensations, but, um, and that's a really tricky word, but we might say emotions. Is that what you mean by feelings? Yeah, so emotions would be like a, a second order derivative of a bodily sensation coming up inside the head brain. That, that's, at least that's the way I would say it. Um, emotions, what else can you be aware of as a known? Memories, exactly. And the, the memories can take the form of visual and, and different layers like implicit memory, explicit memory, absolutely. Okay, so these are mental activities, super important. You know, I do research in something called the adult attachment interview. And I'll just give a shout out to my wonderful, wonderful teacher, Mary Main from UC Berkeley, who sadly, for those of you who don't know, just to honor her, she just passed away a few weeks ago, um, so sad. But she was my teacher in narrative, along with Jerry Bruner, about the narratives we tell, which the narrative story is really, really important, like the story we're telling today. Like my hope is that what we're about to get to um, will be a change in how you are, that the narrative of who you are is going to be different after this gathering for an hour and a half today. You're going to be a different person. And Amanda here, can I give you a shout out, Amanda? Amanda just finished, one of the first people to finish reading Interconnected, the book that this talk is based on. And do you want to say anything about the impact of the book on you or not? Uh, is that too much? <laughs> is there a microphone? Yes, sir. I'll bring it over. Okay. So as we get ready to hear Amanda, and I, I, she didn't know I was going to call her out like this. But um, so what I want to say is that the narrative we have of who we are makes a difference in who we say is like us or not, because we have an identity lens that shifts that. And we're still working on coming back to Justin? Cummings. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I actually wrote Dan an email after I finished the book and said that I wept for an entire day when I was reading it, um, because some of the words helped me to see the history of my own identity with this overarching narrative. Um, that gave me a lot of freedom and released me from some ideas of who I thought I was and showed me it wasn't who I truly was. And my sister is sitting next to me so she can attest to this. When this day happened, I got my entire family on the phone, my parents, Sarah, and my other sister, and cried in front of them and told them what I discovered. Um, and so, yeah, I think that it has given me an immense amount of freedom about pieces of my life that I knew were sort of connected, but I didn't understand how they related to each other. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And, <laughs> and thank you to your sister for being your support team and, and, and the connection that's there. So this idea that the narrative that we're talking about 
um, is like in, in medical school, it would be like, oh, that's not important or whatever. Um, you know, it's just not true. The narrative that we carry around determines who we deem as like us or not like us. You have a kind of an identity lens that you can actually shift. So in this third segment of the rim, you have the opportunity to explore that in this wheel of awareness practice. It's a practice I do every day, um, and it's, it's very empowering for lots of reasons. I'll show you in a moment. But the fourth segment is, um, and we can call that the seventh sense just to keep the numbers going, and that's mental activities. The fourth segment is your relationships, your relationships with human beings, your relationships with all of living beings, with all of nature, with the universe. So that's the relational sense, and we'll just call that the eighth sense, just to keep the numbers going around. So people would go around this, and we did this with Elijah Cummings in this place in Baltimore, but here's what one of my patients came up with, which was such a great idea. Early, early on, the 90s, when the wheel was invented, she said, why don't we bend the spoke around, and let's aim it into the hub. I go, oh my god, what a great idea. And she did it, and she had an experience which, for her, I thought it was just a quirky thing just for one person doing it. But then it turns out that after doing this with 50,000 people and getting some percentage of those to report what it was, it's extremely common. And um, what I tried to do in Interconnected is access some of this just in the way the book is written so that with the, with you, you get the wheel in the book as, a, as an opportunity to do it. But it allows you to see that, and this is what we did in Baltimore was that when people bend the spoke around and they just rest in pure awareness, this is what, after these tens of thousands of people have done it in, in, this, in the first 10,000 in a controlled way, but it doesn't matter how you offer it. Um, people say things like this. Um, I did it in Seattle, and a person took the microphone and he goes, I'm a Microsoft engineer, and I'm 70 years old, and I just retired. My wife is a therapist. She dragged me to see you here. The last thing I want to do is be here. But I did that wheel of awareness thing, and we had taken a break. And then he gets really quiet, and I won't do it in the slowness that he did it. But basically, he says that he goes out from the auditorium, out into this park, and he says, and I see there's the water in the creek, and there's the person watering the roses, and there's the butterflies flapping, and the birds, and now he's crying. And this 500-person auditorium is now totally silent. And he goes, before I did the practice, I thought we're all separate. And now I realize we're all connected. We're all made of the same thing. And now he's crying. I was asked to do this in a parliament in another country that was having a lot of tension around issues about immigration. And we did the Wheel of Awareness. We spent a day together in the parliament. And we did the Wheel of Awareness. And at the break, one of the parliamentarians after the sharing came in, he goes, you know, Dan, I didn't do any sharing. I said, yeah, I noticed that. Very vocal, uh, one, one of the parliamentarians. He goes, do you want to know why I didn't share? I go, yeah, I'd like to know. And he goes, you know the part when you bend the spoke around? I go, yeah, I know that part. He goes, I have never felt so connected to everyone and everything. I've never in my life felt so much love than when I bent that spoke around. And now he's crying. So then there was a pause, and I said, well, can I ask you a question? He goes, yeah. I said, so you don't want to share that with your colleagues? He goes, oh, no. If I said love, they'd think I was weak. So now there's this silence between us. And I said, can I ask you a question? He goes, what's that? I said, are you leaving love out of the reasoning when you make federal policy, when you're making national law? And then his eyes get really, really big. And he waves his finger at me. And he goes over to talk to his colleagues. I don't know what they said. Um, but you can only hope he would realize that that is an absolute error in a strategy for a politician. So coming to Baltimore, when people did the wheel, after they do the wheel, the feeling in the room was completely different. People start talking to each other and connecting with each other, where they realize the color of their skin and their ethnic background doesn't make them dehumanize the other. 
they could see the humanity in one another when they could drop out of that third segment, like me or not like me business, by going to awareness itself. Now, I want to ask you just a couple of things and then see if there are questions. But if we take what Amanda said about your experience of the self, and this was just reading a book, but um, the book went through three prior iterations of trying to, you know, I'm a therapist, so you know, I've written a couple books, so uh, I don't just write a book to try to give information. I try to make it an opportunity for transformation uh, as a book, which is, if you're a writer, that's really hard to do. So three prior attempts were completely rejected. Uh, by my publisher, which is smart, because um, I don't think they would have achieved the same thing that you, you had. But the, the, the issue is, what does it mean to say my sense of self is now transformed, as Amanda is sharing with us? Or in Baltimore, when you talk to people who are black or white in that room, they said, my experience of who I am is now different. Or all the people who do the Wheel of Awareness. You know, as one person, uh, when we did in a workshop, and Esalen said, you know, the wheel brought me to pieces. And she was really agitated about it. And then she paused, and then she, this big smile came on her face in front of all the participants. She goes, but now I'm at peace. You know, or why one of my colleagues is a professor up at UC Berkeley, Dacher Keltner, who just wrote this incredibly beautiful book, which I highly recommend that you go out and get today, called Awe. Or maybe it's called The Power of I don't remember, but Dacker Keltner, K-E-L-T-N-E-R. And so Dacker is watching everyone do the Wheel of Awareness up at our workshop that we're doing together in Esalen. And people are like, you know, spacing out. And, you know, I don't have any history with psychedelics or anything because I have a, a sibling who's um, a recovering addict. So I was uh, allergic to doing anything like that ever. So uh, anyway, so Dacker says, I want to give the mystical experiences scale that's given when people take psychedelics. I said, OK, whatever. So he gives it to the people who have just done the wheel, and they get the same score as if they were on mushrooms, only without the side effects. So it was so amazing, because the wheel has these three pillars in it that you probably know about, the foundations of, you know, if you, yeah, I was at a research meeting on mindfulness, mindfulness research. And you know, there, there wasn't an agreement on what mindfulness really was. Half the people said it was attention and awareness training. Half the people said, sure, it's attention, awareness, and compassion training. And they very mindfully disagreed. And they couldn't come to a consensus about uh, mindfulness, what it really meant. And it, it was really kind of frustrating. So part of what I think my role in, in these different things I'm involved in is to like be a bridge. So I said, well, what if we came up with a different term that just enunciated what you're studying? They go, what would that be? I said, it'd be like three pillars. It would be attention training for attention to become more focused, awareness training for awareness to become more open, and intention training, the three things I tested in Laura, to become kinder and more compassionate. So intention trained to be kind, awareness trained to be open, and attention trained to be focused, meaning sustained on a chosen target, when you get distracted, let the distraction go, and then return the focus to your intended focus. OK, so I said, what if we call that three-pillar mind training? And they go, yes. And 100% of these researchers said, that's fine. Let's call it that. So let's just name it three-pillar mind training. So when you do three-pillar training, and it's usually in different kinds of things that you do, not the wheel. But the wheel has all three in them, just fortunately. But when you do that, what do you get? And I want to just name these in honor of the mindfulness, the mindfulness science center you have here. Um, and if there were going to be a test for today, this would be the test. What are the five experiences, besides feeling more connected and love that, that, that is described? And, and we'll get into that in a moment. But just so you know, what are five positive benefits of doing three-pillar mind training, which some people would say is mindfulness plus compassion. Other people would say it's just mindfulness. Number one, you reduce the stress hormone cortisol, which is a good thing, reduction in stress. Number two, you improve immune function. That's a good thing, whether you have a pandemic or not. Number three, you improve cardiovascular risk factors, meaning if your blood pressure is high, you lower it. 
cholesterol is high, you lower it, and you improve what's called heart rate variability coherence. Basically, the heart in the chest is communicating in a more integrated way with the head brain. Number four, you modify the epigenetic, meaning the non-DNA molecules sitting on top of genes, epigenetic regulators, you modify them to reduce systemic inflammation. Your mind actually changes the epigenetic regulators that control inflammation. And if that were not enough, number five, and I was just with the researcher who studied this with her colleague, there's Alyssa Eppel who studied this with Elizabeth Blackburn who got the Nobel Prize for discovering the system of telomerase and the ends of the chromosomes called telomeres, which maintain the integrity, like on a shoelace, you know, you have these little, what are they called? What's the little cap? Aglets, aglets. So the aglets, you know, helps your shoelace. So if you have to re-put it through the little, what, what are the holes called? Eyelets? The aglets through the eyelets. Um, anyway, it keeps them in attack. So every time your cell reproduces, you know, if you have, don't have enough of the aglets, the telomeres, you know, then it starts to fray. The, the cell gets sick and dies, and you get sick and die. So it's a sign of not just stress and aging, but it's a sign of basically how long you can live a healthy life, your health span. So Elizabeth Blackburn is the researcher who got the Nobel Prize for studying that. And she, with Alyssa Eppel, wrote a beautiful book I highly recommend called The Telomere Effect. And you can even get a very practical application of that called The Stress Prescription by Eppel um, that just came out. But I say all that to say that three-pillar practice optimizes telomerase levels. So when Alyssa Eppel saw the manuscript for AWARE, which kind of summarized all this, she said, you left something out. I said, what did I leave out? I, I can't write another chapter. She goes, no, no, no. You left out a statement. I said, what statement did I leave out? Three-pillar practice, you know, mindfulness or mindfulness plus compassion. She said, it slows the aging process. I said, that's outrageous. You're going to say mindfulness slows the aging process. She goes, yeah. This is the world's expert in aging, by the way. She said, that's what we've proven. You've got to say it. So with a lot of trepidation, because you want to be very conservative when you make statements, we can say that. In addition, if you had to summarize in an elevator speech, what does mindfulness do to the brain? Does anyone know what the mindfulness, what the, what the elevator speech would be? Now, Jodice, you may disagree with this. We never talked about this. But my reading of all the different research I can find on three-pillar practice shows that differentiated areas in the brain become more linked. For example, the hippocampus grows. The corpus callosum grows. The prefrontal cortex grows in significant ways. And the connectome, which are the differentiated areas more subtly differentiated, becomes more interlinked called the, it's a more interconnected connectome, meaning the differentiated areas are linked. Those four ways of measuring both structural and functional integration are improved. That's from the contemplative science, study of meditation, for example. But if you look at the Smith and colleague paper from 2015, which I'm sure you know which one I'm talking about, Smith is such an unusual name, um, you find that when they measured every measure of well-being they could find, what was the one brain factor that correlated, at least, with every measure of well-being these different research institutions looked at? It was how interconnected the connectome was. So one aspect, at least, of how integrated your brain is is the best predictor of numerous measures of well-being. So I say all that to say that in Baltimore, not only were these people able to collaborate and communicate, but if they continued a three-pillar practice, whatever it is, but this would be wheel of awareness to be one. That one hasn't been studied, but includes all three of the pillars. You would then be able to predict that they would have these six ways their lives are changed. But the thing I want to end with is, what is the self that was changed in Baltimore? What's the self that was changed when Amanda read this book, Intraconnected? And what is this word anyway? So here's what I'll tell you very, very briefly. And I go through this in the book. Um, when I was at USC, uh, in addition to being doing this stuff with biochemistry, I, you know, I took a general education course and I took a course in anthropology with a professor named Partridge. I don't know if he's still here, but um, it was on um, uh, it was basically documentaries about different cultures. And then he invited me to go to Mexico, 
and to uh, work in, with the World Health Organization for the United Nations. And in the course of doing that, I was supposed to interview folk healers um, about how their practices interface with Western medicine. Anyway, and I was given the assignment of going up from the state of Veracruz to the state of Oaxaca, for those of you who know Mexico, um, on horseback. And I was going to go visit the queen of the mushrooms. Right Now, keep in mind, I have a sibling who's actively an addict at this time. And so I'm going like, what am I doing? What is this all about? So anyway, so I'm going on the horse, go, going to see the Queen of the Mushrooms. And how many of you have seen Michael Pollan's documentary on Netflix, uh, How to Change Your Mind? Well, it's not in his book, but it's featured in this film. So finally, I had to meet her, because on my way to meet her, we're, we're at a full gallop. And I love riding horses. The saddle that, of the horse I'm on gets loose. It turns to his belly. My feet stay in the stirrups. And I'm dragged, they tell me, for about 100 yards. Destroys my whole face, lose these teeth, break the nose, break my arm. And they thought I was dead. And obviously, I wasn't dead. They thought I broke my neck. I didn't break my neck. But they bring me to the clinic that I'd been studying, actually. And for 24 hours, rather than all this you know, bone problem, you know, the biggest thing that happened was I had no identity. I had no idea who I was. And everything was hilarious. I was just like, they would give me like a, a glass of water. I'd be laughing. The light would be going through it. I'd just go, whoa. <laughs> like this, like, nothing had a word to it. It was like incredible. And I was just laughing and funny, even though I had these broken teeth and all this stuff. Anyway, so for 24 hours, I had no idea who I was. And then I started asking, who am I? Who am I? And then finally, I, I had this memory that this body called Dan had a name. So I want to ask you, if there's a narrative of you with that body you were born into and the name that was given to you, Laura, Jonas, Dan, whatever your name is, is that the totality of who you are? No. Right. Yet in modern culture, we say that the self is basically a synonym for the individual. Even in my field, we have terms like self-regulation and self-awareness and you know, self-compassion. Self is the individual. But what is the self if it's not limited to your narrative self? So what I do in the interconnected book, because I'm a developmentalist, you know, I'm trained in, in human development, is I, I take us through development, not just evolutionary development, which is in there too, but your individual development of you, and maybe this is what I don't know if this is what impacted you, Amanda, but you know, where I say, look, and we're not going to go through all the stages here, but to say you start out as a sperm and egg, but even before that stuff is going on. But now let's talk about the sperm and egg get together. They form you. You have this incredible moment you know, where just like all the cells in evolutionary history, the membrane of the cell made a distinction that allowed that cell to survive. There was what was inside and what was outside. But if a cell in your body, for example, which has the important membrane to say, hey, I got my organelles inside. I do my enzymatic reactions based on an equilibrium that I maintain within this cell. But if I'm like part of the liver cell, or if I'm a part of the heart, or if I'm a part of the muscles, and I stop believing that my identity is a part of a larger system than, than just the internal cell, in medicine, what do we call that? Cancer. cancer. We call it cancer. And in psychology, we might call it narcissism, right? <laughs> I heard you. Uh, so, right. So what I want to suggest to you is that in modern culture, not in indigenous teachings, and it's not in contemplative teachings, and these are from thousands of years ago, and I try to make quotes from our indigenous elders from all around the world. You'll see them in the book and also from contemplative teachings as well. Independently, so E.O. Wilson would call this consilience. When you find a common finding from independent pursuits of knowledge, we call it consilience. So what you'll see is a consilient view that says, in indigenous teachings, like the Tongva and the Chumash here in Southern California, what we call Southern California, in contemplative teachings from all sorts of traditions, it is a known vulnerability of humanity to mistake the individual as self. 
But what does modern culture do? Maybe originally deriving from Western European uh, views, but certainly now it's around the world, so we'll call it modern. It tells us that the self is separate. You're born into your body. My parents said to me, Danny, you got to do this. Danny did that, do Danny did this. And there was nothing about the self being larger than the body. So what I want to say in conclusion is, what actually is this self thing, right? Because it seems so natural to say it's a synonym for the individual. But what I want to say is that there is a center of experience. If you look at all the sciences of self, there's a center of experience that involves three things that spell the word spa. And this is what I'll conclude with. It's your subjective sense that we began with. It's the perspective you have, like seeing through the point of view that you're taking. And it's agency, what you're acting on behalf of. And spa are the three features that we're going to use to say that you have an internal self, yes. And you should enjoy that self. You should take care of that body you're born into, sleep the body well, feed the body well, exercise the body well, enjoy it. No one is saying there's no internal self. You even have a narrative about it. This one is named Dan. I call it ABCD on Zoom, a body called Dan. You know, and uh, that's what I put on my Zooms. You know, uh, but, but if I were to think the whole center of my experience ends with my skin, ends and begins with this, then we're going to be cooked. Because you can take an identity lens, which I hope you'll do after today, and realize that you can have a subjective sense of a one-on-one -on -one relationship you have. You can take the perspective of a relationship. You can act on behalf of that relationship, the we, not just the me. But then you realize we is not just about you and one-on-one. -on -one. It's about all of humanity, whatever color of skin or shape of body we have. And then when you really widen that identity lens, you come to realize that you can feel into not just the interconnected nature of things, which is I have a body here, you have a body there, we have all of nature, all interconnected. That's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thich Nhat Hanh has a great phrase, interbeing. But the inter implies a betweenness. Intraconnected is a word that comes from the experience of being alone in a forest, where you say, gosh, this body that you were all born into, the body you're born into, is one part of a much larger story. And when you learn that you have an identity lens, just like a camera, and go from that close-up focus on your body to a little bit larger to your relationship with the people you know, larger to all of humanity, our human family, larger still to all of nature, then you're going to feel the subjective experience of that intraconnected way of being, the perspective, and act on behalf of it. And imagine a world of 8 billion of us now could adjust that identity lens and act in the collaborative, creative, compassionate way that human beings are capable of if they don't narrow that lens down and become too differentiated, but instead embrace the integration of me, the internal, with we, the relational, with people and the planet. And that becomes the interconnected identity of we. And integration like that, made visible, is kindness and compassion. And that's a world, together, we can all create in our connections with one another. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.